NetApp is pleased to sponsor these Theater 3 sessions. Just as DISA is transforming itself into being a software-focused service provider, so NetApp has already made that transition itself with the unique ability to be able to move VMs and applications that are virtualized from any data source into any cloud. Our panelists include Mr. Miguel Cerritos Artisan, who is the IT Services Division Chief for DISA's Enclave Services for 4 e &O. Mr. Cerritos Artisan is the Program Manager and expert in various IT disciplines, and he began his government service as a lead system administrator for DISA's BRAC action moving from Virginia to Fort Meade. In his 10 years at DISA, Mr. Cerritos Artisan has served as Branch Chief for Operations Engineering, as well as Network Operations and Branch Chief for Server Operations, and most recently, the Division Deputy for the IT Services Division. And in 2018, he won the George F. Hoffman Civilian Leadership Award. Mr. Corey Hawkins, at the end, is the Deputy for the Global Service Desk for DISA. He supports warfighters, military components, mission partners, and other federal agencies with a single point of entry for service desk support. Prior to his leadership in the Global Service Desk, he was the branch chief for Tier 1 and Tier 2 desktop support agents for 38 field sites and DISA headquarters. He served, as, he served DISA in the branch chief roles at the Oklahoma City Operations Division, Enterprise Email Operating System, and Microsoft Operating System. He began his career as a Marine at Camp Pendleton and later became a communications warrant officer in the Oklahoma Army National Guard. Ms. Laura Herbertson is the Division Chief and Deputy Program Manager for 4 e &O at DISA's DES. She's an experienced program manager who specializes in complex acquisition programs and services. She began her government career as a mechanical engineer at Picatinny Arsenal, working small caliber ammunition. She was a materiel developer, system engineer, and project lead for a variety of ammunition efforts. She's been with DISA for 11 years, and her roles include Deputy PM for the Global Network Services Contract, an analyst for the Executive Deputy Director's Office, the Acquisition Division Chief for NBIS, and the Deputy PM for Geeks J. Please welcome our distinguished panelists. Thank you. Very good. Thank you, Don. So I'm Miguel Cerritos. I'm going to kick us off. Uh, first off, I just want to thank you all for coming here. I uh, see we have a big showing, uh, so I guess you guys won't forget uh, this particular panel. Actually, we just had a little bit of excitement. Uh, but we're from the Fourth State Network Optimization Office, and we're going to cover the Macy's, many ACs, one common network. Uh, before we begin, though, i got to kick off with one quick disclaimer. So everything we say here is subject to change. Uh, we're going to describe a little bit more about who we are, uh, where we came from, what we're doing right now and where we're going. Um, as that happens, uh, things can evolve, of course, so you're going to hear a little bit more of our discussion. Uh, a little bit about how we're going to do this is we're going to show you a set of slides that describe a little bit of that, that history, and then as we're doing that, we're going to have a little bit of discussion in between. So you're going to have an opportunity for us to have some questions and answers, and hopefully that will help you out when we get to the Q&A section so that you also have questions for us and we'll be able to answer. So as Don said, uh, I'm Miguel, and uh, my job is as the Chief of IT Services Division, but what that essentially means is I oversee the backend infrastructure, uh, the operations. We oversee the daily governance uh, for what we do to include change management, configuration management of DODNet. That is our network service. Uh, and I collaborate heavily with my colleagues over here, but also a lot of people that are not here today, uh, so it's a big team effort. And now I'm going to kick it off to Mr. Corey Hawkins. Thank you, Miguel. So, welcome everybody. My name, again, is Corey Hawkins. I'm the deputy for the Global Service Desk. We manage the Tier 1 and Tier 2 entry point um, for all of DISA. Uh, we have, as we onboard the DAFAs, uh, we're taking over some of the roles and responsibilities for that, too. Um, we manage, uh, we're, we're growing into the Tier 2, which is the desktop support for uh, the DAFAs. Uh, we do it for DISA. Uh, we have a lot of mission that we cover down on the Tier 1. Uh, for our, almost all of the DOD, we've got different portions, different uh, classification levels. So um, with that, hand it over to Laura. Thank you. Hi. Um, my name is Laura Herbertson. So 
my daily duties of program manager of DODNet is um, contracts, acquisition, resourcing, financials, manpower, making sure that these two, as they operate their services, are resourced to operate their services. Um, we take strategy, the big strategies that you're hearing here, the initiatives from the department, the strategy from the, the agency, and we make sure those are reflected in what we're doing uh, every day. So those, that's my focus, to support them. Um, so a little bit about us. Uh, we, we have a lot of terms. <laughs> you hear us say Fourth Estate Network Optimization. That's the name of our program. Fourth Estate refers to all of the civilian agencies, uh, the defense agencies, DFAS, DLA, MDA, us, DISA. Um, those are our customers. And what we're working on is every single one of them has a separate nipper and sipper, a classified, unclassified network that they have and they operate. What we're saying under network optimization is let's collapse all of those efforts, those, those unique, different processes, tool sets that they have. Let's standardize across a DOD uh, enterprise. And let's call this thing DODNet. So we call our network DODNet. We call our program Fourth Estate Network Optimization. And what we call Defense Enclave Services is all of the services that you can order from us, all of those services that we support. It's, it's not just the network, it's not just DODNA, but it's also circuits, Office 365, phones, anything that you need. Like when you have a regular employee show up to work and they sit down at their laptop, everything that they have right there, make them productive employees, that's what we do under Defense Enclave Services. Our vision for the future is, it doesn't matter who you are, where you are. Uh, you have an endpoint on our network, we're going to secure that, that endpoint. Um, you could be at home. You could be in DISA headquarters. You can be in, in Indianapolis. You can be in DFAS. But that endpoint is a DOD net endpoint, and it does not matter. So that's the vision that we're trying to get to, is all that end user support, that end user's experience. Um, how do we get from here where we are today taking that disparate network from another field agency and making this grand scalable vision across the enterprise. So our goals uh, that we're trying to get to is we, we are considered an IT reform effort um, where we, we um, operate under the, the department, op, uh, sorry, <laughs> we operate under the department IT reform goals so one of the things that we try to do is strengthen the cybersecurity as we go out and we look at these other agencies, we say, okay, what is your operating procedures? How do we normalize? How do we standardize those? How do we move you from where you were into this single service environment, this single service nipper and sipper? And how do we make that work? You know, what are your requirements? What are your unique capabilities? What's your unique mission? And the whole point of doing this is so that DISA will become the single service provider of DODNet, of Defense Enclave Services, allowing all of the other agencies out there in the Department of Defense to focus on their core competencies. Like M MDA does missiles, um, DARPA, you know, they have their core functions of their agencies. So we would provide the IT backbone to those. And who's our customer base? In Pretty much the civilian agencies. Right now, we are scoped to the the fourth estate, which we call you know it's not the COCOMs, it's not the military departments, it's the it's the wonderful customers you see on this slide, and they have been amazing. They've been providing excellent support with us so far. Um, we are happy to work with them. They are on board, and it's such it's such a partnership to do it this way to just come across and say. Okay, I understand you've been doing this network this way for this many years. We're going to tear that down, and here's a new thing. And they've just been amazing to work with. So, if there's anyone out there, thank you so much for your cooperation so far. Okay, so this is part of the discussion um, that topics that we wanted to talk about. One of the questions we get frequently is, how do I sell hardware and software to to Fourth State? How do I sell to DODNet? Um, we have created a, ca a catalog. It's a contract. It's a contract off NASA soup of 
all of the items that we buy, all the hardware and software items, it's pre-priced, there's competition, there's multiple sellers on every single category. But this is where we buy things. All of our endpoints, all of our big network infrastructure, the software, the hardware, this is our go-to vehicle. And it's not just us. This vehicle is open to all of the other fourth estate agencies to buy their things. This was one of the first steps that we did to try to standardize, make sure everybody's buying something that we know is interoperable and that we can secure and that we can maintain and patch in the long run. So at this point, I'll turn it over to the discussion um, and I'll toss the question over to Miguel. How do we buy, what do we buy? How do we buy, what's an approved product and how do you get on it? So in terms of our approved products list or software list, it starts off with a requirement. So one of the things that we're looking at is to see and understand what is common, right? What is it that's going to be used by uh, two agencies or more? And then from there, we want to understand how are they going to use it and what do we need to test? So our group will actually analyze that requirement. We're going to then do test use cases against it. We're going to scan that device or that software, and we're going to then take those artifacts. And based on that evaluation, we'll return it back to the program office. Assuming that that is a gone to approval, for at least from a strategy perspective, we're going to give those scans and those other results to our risk management uh, executives. And we're going to look to see if they can be authorized onto the network. So every product that we have on our catalog has to be accredited onto our environment. Uh, we also need to understand how it's going to be operated. So my group, like I said before, is the one that sees the backend infrastructure. I, I need to understand, can we support this? What are the complexities of this uh, product? How often does it need to be updated? What is a long-term sustainment strategy? Can I deprecate another product in order to use this product? Right? So we, we are not in the business of trying to have a variety for the sake of it. We want to make sure that we're actually just meeting those uh, set requirements first. And so there is a full-fledged process that we look at for the full life cycle of that system. And as Laura mentioned before, this product can change. So what you may see of vendors today may uh, be different tomorrow. So it, it allows for competition and ingenuity and innovation. Mm. So once it gets on the approved product list that Miguel maintains, at that point, we, we put it on the catalog. We'll work with any kind of resellers, and we also have, um, it could be an onboarding trigger. At, at any point in this contract, we can open it up and say, there's a new product, we need new resellers. If there's not enough competition for a particular item on there, we try to have at least three to five resellers on this contract. Um, so you can, it, there is opportunity to get on this, so you just watch for um, any time that we open it up for competition. But. Okay, the next discussion topic we wanted to, they gave us a microphone and we get to pick the topic, so I'm sorry. So The next topic we wanted to tell you guys about is, um, another question we get is, hey, can I test this thing out on DODNet? I got this great new thing, I want to play around with it, can I test it out on DODNet? Um, we are a network largely in operations and sustainment. Um, we don't have RDT and E capabilities. We don't have test beds or development prototypes. Actually, what we do here is we partner with the rest of DISA, um, emerging, te emerging Technologies and Steve Wallace's team. We rely on them. Yes, do your testing, do your inventions, um, do your innovations, test those things out. Where we get involved is when it's operationally ready. Like when you are ready for that 200 user pilot, that's when we get involved. Because um, we, I mean, we're going to have a network of hundreds of thousands of users after we're done this migration in a couple years. So that, it, that's ready. Like one of the things that we look for is can it be scaled? How do we operate it? How do we keep it sustained? How much manpower is this going to need? How much money is this going to need? What does this look like? So, uh, I'll toss it over to Corey first. Okay. You've been silent. So, when we, when we were approached to do a pilot, what is the, one of the things that Global Service Desk wants to take a look at? Okay, so, the primary goal of the Service Desk is a return to service. We're, we're there to take the uh, incident, which is a customer calling us and saying, something is not working. So, when we start a pilot, we want to gather the knowledge management around that application that tool so that we understand when we get that call how do we handle it can we do a first call resolution is it something that my tier one agents are able to do a password reset or some type of uh, 
first call resolution where we're not handing the ticket off to a tier two level. That's primary goal number one. So the way that we support the pilots and help them move into production is we gather that information in the very beginning. That enables us to do uh, the first call. Then, if, we, if it's a event or an incident that cannot be handled at a tier one level, part of our KM gathering is understanding who are the other support teams, the tier twos, the tier threes, uh, that we need to engage. And when do we engage them? So it's all focused around our KM, getting that ticket into the hands of the next tier level that can support resolution and, and return to service. Um, and it also, we, you know, you have to gather information like classification. Um, you, wh how do we interact with the C2? What information do we need to have available to our C2s at the different tiers and within the different agencies and different departments to make sure that they have actionable information that they can um, provide support on? Um, and then KPIs. We need to know what is the threshold that this application, this pilot, uh, what, are, what are the key point indicators that we want to measure so that from a service provider we understand um, what is good, what is bad, and, and the in-between, you know, the left and right uh, parameters of the, of the pilot. So those are some of the key things that as a tier one, tier two, um, that we need to gather during the first phases of the pilot we refine that information from what we've learned through the pilot, and then we bring it into, um, as we move into production, we make sure the information and the data that we gathered can be scalable and move into a larger production environment. Okay. Thank you. And for my part, so we have to also take a look at the bigger picture. Uh, we need to understand, of course, what was the original requirement or vision that you had uh, for this effort. So. Uh, for example, we are, are introduced to different tool sets, uh, demonstrations, and sometimes we can see those demonstrations and they have these great capabilities, but they require quite a bit of skill set involved just to be able to leverage them fully. If we don't have inherent knowledge, then even for you all, we're not going to get that biggest uh, return on investment. So you will say that it can do this, this, and this, and we're only doing this one piece of it, this one subcomponent of it. You want us to use that full total capability, but we need to understand what that looks like. Was that uh, defined in your IOC? What does your FOC look like? Uh, I need to understand more about the tier structure model that you thought we were going to have implemented, and therefore, how, is it, how are we going to respond back to that? Does your system or architecture have resiliency built into it? Does it have uh, interactions with other components of the network, maybe other p components of the endpoint? You know, I, I think there was a lot of discussion here about endpoint performance. And there's always uh, some system that may talk about an agent. Uh, agents are great up until the point that they have to interact with other components of the operating system. Up until you have to understand how a group policy or a STIG or a AVM will now interfere with, you, with your requirement. So was there tail end support that wasn't defined? So what is the true total cost of ownership going to look like? Were there hidden costs that were involved? So when we look at maturity of a solution, we are trying to guide along uh, where you are from a pilot perspective, but we're trying to make sure that it has an operational model. Because at the end of the day, if, if I can't support it and I can't represent your tool effectively, then you're going to get a call from me saying, well, what are we going to do next? How's my tier four vendor support going to get involved here to help us better, to mature this product level? So we really need to make sure that that full cycle, that full vision is, is brought to fruition. And that takes a lot of work and team effort. Mm. Right, and from my perspective, when we talk about new capabilities, new technologies, how much more money is it gonna cost? Because it's not like we, we get a new capability and new dollars come with it. it. We have to cut something that already exists. So things I ask is, well, what can I stop doing? What can I sunset? What can I turn off in order to turn this on? How is this gonna save us money? And if the answer is it's not, but it's gonna add you know, three units of cybersecurity but cost you $10 million, we do these cost risk benefits and saying this might actually not be worth it. So even if you get a green light from global service desk, you get a green light from operators, if it's still not there and it doesn't come with dollars and money, it might actually just end up a good idea that never gets implemented. Um, those are the type of things that we look at in why it feels like sometimes when the ideas come to us, we always say no, 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 and that's not us. I mean, we want we want to get to this end state. We want automation. We want this, but we want it 
for different reasons. You know, we, we need to reduce costs. We need to get faster. We need to provide better service faster, but without adding any money and manpower to the networks. So. Okay. Um, the other discussion is where do we all fit? Why are we doing this? So I guess it started about three years ago, and DoD had a, has a problem statement. All of the separate agencies that comprise of the DOD have silos, right? They have their own ingrown um, networks, their architecture, their personnel, their contracts, their tools. They don't talk to each other. So this got started as an IT reform effort, one of many, and it was, all right, well, what can we do? If we consolidate all of these services together, if we create an enterprise um, service called DODNet, called Defense Enclave Services, it, this was primarily IT reform cost reduction efforts. Um, our deliverable, I like to say, is actually two things. It's delivering DOD net, but it's also delivering cost savings. So we, when we focus on this, um, it's both an operational and network issue, but it's also we, you know, larger strategy in the sky is reform. So. Where we fit in the greater DOD-wide visions of you know, the cloud strategy, the data strategy, so we are supporting, we're working toward that end state goal, the DOD-wide end state goal. So the first question is over to Corey. What is a global service desk doing to reach that end state? Thank you, Laura. So again, with the global service desk, we want to, to create transparency. Uh, one of the keys that we have when we onboard uh, new customers is we want to create transparency with your ticket. We want to be able to have a portal that the customer can go to to see what their, their tickets, if they have VIPs, can they track how many VIPs they have working, that they're, they're working tickets for. Um, we want to create a environment where when, when we have an event, an incident, I can track that trick, that ticket through all the different tiers of support so that when we get that call of what's going on, what, what is the latest on this ticket, it's not lost with another um, department or another group. We can look at the complete life cycle of that ticket from beginning to where it currently is. And what that allows us to do is find areas where, where tickets in certain applications or events might get hung up. You know, nothing's more frustrating than getting a, a something happening. It's your ticket, whether it's Cox Cable or, or, you know, your PC isn't working, and you call, and that ticket hasn't been assigned to somebody, you know, or the ticket's been sitting in a, a bucket and not have anybody look at it. Well, that's part of our team's goal is to track that metric, to make sure that tickets are getting assigned and that they're not just getting tossed around between the different levels of support or the different tiers. Uh, because that prolongs the uh, customer satisfaction, which is return to service. So as we have evolved with, um, within the 4E, 4E construct, those are some of the key point indicators and metrics that we measure and that we share with our customers. We have meetings uh, weekly and some customers monthly where we go over those type of metrics to report, hey, are you getting a good service? And if not, what I love is when customers call and say, hey, we're not getting service and they provide me a ticket because then I go pull, I can pull the initial phone call and the recording of that and then all the way up to the end of that ticket and track. And then it allows me as a service provider to analyze, train and uh, adjust processes, adjust uh, um, everything so that we as a provider refine sometimes on a daily basis how we provide our service and, and we have metrics and the, the greatest thing is we can provide metrics versus just a, a, a feeling or an impression or I think I can I can uh, back up our data our 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 information with data points and then with those data points we provide growth best practices um, and, and items like that. Thank you, Laura. Yep. So wouldn't it be cool if <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, Miguel? What is what are you doing to help the department and DoD Net reach this end state optimization goal? Yeah, so one of the things we have to look at is all of the use cases and their commonalities. Uh, I think we hit upon it. So there are, it's estimated to be about half a million users uh, going across 800 locations. 
they all have different starting points. Uh, we're going to hit on that a little bit later on as, as to how we do the migration from a high-level perspective. But when you're looking across the board at all of that, you're going to find what I'll nicely call silos of excellence. Right? You're, in certain cases, uh, you'll have individuals that are experts in many things or, or one person being overloaded and overwhelmed with many uh, efforts and roles. And we're going to be able to now actually homogenize that environment and we're going to provide specialists into those different capabilities. Also, by streamlining the, the service, we're going to have a better fit uh, for what they require um, so that when the customer or the end user ha needs something, they have someone that they can reach out to directly for that entire service, that entire capability. Uh, additionally, when we look at the software that's being used across the department, it's a wide variety and some of them are duplicates of each other. And so by not having a standard approach and you're trying to say that uh, DOD or, or the fourth estate, we need to now uh, harden the environment. Well, that can mean various activities that you just asked for. Now we're able to bring that under one, uh, one space. Additionally, one of the things that we also do is we are enabling uh, the fourth estate partners to actually focus on their mission. And part of that includes just that when they need to move to the cloud or to some other environment, we have to make sure that their network infrastructure is, is available. So, one, for example, when I spoke to one of our partners, uh, they were still moving to the cloud service, and we talked about, well, what's the circuit capacity that they have today? I won't give up the number, but it was very low. And, and for that, we were able to actually champion for them to have a higher speed, higher capability, uh, and it was a bit more of a collaborative effort to make sure that they were successful in what, in what they needed to do. Again, by offloading also their common use, common workload, uh, they were able to focus their staff to just their mission. Additionally, what we also do is we look a little bit more forward, leaning forward towards the cloud environments. So we are understanding more about what is available within the DS space for ILO 5, ILO 6. We're looking more at software as a service capabilities, mm -hmm. how can we better utilize the full uh, capacity and the power and harness the, of the cloud. Uh, because ultimately what we know is that while we are supporting our customers of the fourth estate, our customers are supporting the warfighter. So there is a domino effect that actually happens that if we are able to provide a high level of service, they are able to provide a high quality of workload and therefore improve the, everybody within the department. So it's a, it's a big responsibility that we have. And, and I wanted to jump on one more thing with the tier two. As Miguel highlighted, we talked about the standard software packages, the standard image, a, a homogenous network. Um, one of the things that we, I, I didn't highlight, but it's, it's a key point, is as we move to a DOD net construct that has the four E agencies moving into, as it has DISA, JSP, as we move all these agencies into the same network with a, with a common image, which is on their workstation from a tier two perspective, it also allows me because everybody has that tier two, that service desk or a desktop person that's the expert. We all know who it is. You know, if I said, who would you get to come fix your, your desktop? Everybody in this room has somebody they would think of. Well, as we move into a construct that has DOD net, I now gather up more of those experts and I can have them virtually support across the DOD net to help with you know, those, those higher level problems you know, somebody's desktop's not working. As long as the desktop's not down, you know, they can remote in. They can, they can do the over-the-shoulder look with the other Tier 2 agents. And now, as an agency, I'm providing not just that one person that you're thinking of that was the expert. I've got a multitude of those experts that I can pull information from. And what we have found is, as individuals, these experts have hey, did you know how to do this? Or hey, I had this cool thing that I do that fixes this problem. Now I've created this larger uh, community of knowledge management that we share across the board. And now these experts are becoming more talented, these tier two uh, support agents, as they get the lessons learned from other groups within the DOD. So it creates a very uh, larger knowledge base and hom homogenous team that just doesn't support an agency, but now it's supporting a larger department-wide effort. Okay. Oh, messed my shirt. Oh, okay. So, um, other topic we wanted to talk about, we got a lot of questions. Well, how are you doing the migrations? And also, one of my favorite is, why is it so slow? Um, so, it's not easy to go into a network that we've never seen before, um, familiarize ourselves with it, and make it look like DODNet. It's, 
we broke it down into a methodical five-step process, um, but it is heavy coordination, it's heavy engineering workload from both us as well as the customer and everybody that we partner with along the way. Um, when you're talking about an entire network, you're talking about multiple engineering and, and different technologies. I and mean, you're talking about subject matter experts in every single area from software to infrastructure to architecture to services. We pull everybody together and we structure them into different product teams. And we start initialization. What are, what are the entrance and exit criteria as we go through these phases? Um, and we break it down to schedules and documents and plans, site surveys at every single location. And some of these agencies are worldwide, and hundreds of locations everywhere. Yep. There might be surprises. You know, we go in, and okay. Um, but we break it down. We have standard templates and documents. And we've, we've generally worked out this process. But I think people are surprised when we say it typically takes 10 to 12 months in order to tackle this and, and take it from initialization down to when we first actually start handing a user, here, here, welcome to DODNet, here's your user guide. Just because we want to make sure that these networks, as we migrate them, they ha they're continuing to work. They have to support this agency mission. I mean, it's vital that we coordinate our ASIs and we make sure that we're not interrupting any kind of agency mission as we do this. And we work with them and all of their locations, all of their you know, mission sets that they have, their mission apps, make sure everything as we do it is still functioning, ready to go, and that we're providing value as we, as we go. So, um, first question, over to Miguel. What are some of the challenges that you found, what are, and uh, what did we do to resolve them? So, there, there are a few, of course. Uh, one of them would be, let's go over the site survey. So, I, I think we want to make sure that we don't undersize or over, uh, overstate or simplify the requirement. When I talk about site survey, I actually mean we're going to be visiting these locations. You have to know the street address of where we're going to go. You have to roam the halls, understand the kill plan. You need to be able to talk to the facility manager of a particular building. Um, we have one agency that has over 300 locations. How are we going to do that site survey? How are we going to understand? Why does that matter? Well, it's important. Right? We need to make sure that there's a circuit. We need to make sure that the transport's available to them. If there is a cloud solution that uh, one of you propose as, uh, as what's going to be the future, that's fantastic. How are they going to reach that cloud? Right? There needs to be a stability of service for them to actually do their workloads. Now, in addition to that, we talked before that in IT, under IT reform, some of those mission support systems, they're also going to the clouds. So we need to make sure that they have stability as well. But in the site surveys, you have to have a team. You have to coordinate with the with the staff, with the agencies, and speak to what are we going, how long are we going to be there for, how much information can we capture, what build materials is required as a result of the site survey, who's going to pay for it, all of these components, when are we going to install it, when are we going to replace the network equipment, perhaps the equipment that they have there today is either not of your standard or end of life equipment. How are we going to transition them in their current state to the new state of, of hardware and software before we are able to actually begin the migration? So there's a lot of, of collaboration that has to happen and a lot of, uh, of people on the ground to make this work. Uh, so there are elements of this where we talk about automation, but there are also elements of this where it is manual. It, it does require us to have boots on the ground, to be able to open the rooms, to walk into the hallways, to understand what's going on. Uh, preceding that, of course, is the, the requirements. What is that agency, what is their mission space? What applications do they have? Do they have a mission application that must be on the endpoint? If they do, how can we support it? How can we can make sure that's going to be on our accreditation. Can the GSD support that special application? Does it have special ports and protocols? So there, there's a lot there tied into it. And that's why it has to be all phased out with milestones. If we aren't able to achieve these milestones, then we have to go back and make sure that we understand the requirement even further. And that requires more discussion, more collaboration. And, and so uh, another part of this is we have to make sure that we communicate not just uh, to our own staff, but also to the customer when to anticipate, when to anticipate things. They need to project their own migration. They need to understand what their employees are going to anticipate. Do there, are their employees out in travel? Do they need to come back for a certain period of time? What does that migration look like for them? 
what disruption am I causing for them in, on, in that migration? And then what happens the day after? Now they have to have a new service desk. What's that phone number going to be? All right, so that entire experience has to be laid out for them to understand what's going to happen. So we all talk about seamless uh, integrations, but this is really where the rubber meets the road. And we understand that there are so many different uh, equities involved here that it, it just requires a lot of hard work and, and effort to put in place. Additionally, now that this is expanded environment under one common network, you explain also what is the risk factor? What did we just inherit? Um, how do I make sure that our authorizing official is comfortable with now the compliance of this environment? Is it segmented out? So there are various aspects of this. Uh, and so, the, so Laura, there's a lot of challenges, I would say, <laughs> uh, to this whole space. And, and not to mention that for every time that we grow, that's another team, another larger 24 by seven effort. Um, the anticipation or the expectation of the customer can be high. Uh, their, their bar of, of service should be that it's always running, always available. Right? We just said that we are gonna take over the common use cases. It's no longer their responsibility to work about this workload. So we need to make sure that we're also working with our partners within DISA as well to make sure that these services are fully up running and optimized. And we understand what's happening within the environment. So there's a lot of uh, uh, need for interoperability, a lot of collaboration of governance, uh, a lot of changes of change management. Uh, if you were here yesterday, I think, I think in this seat, they had the command and control panel, and they were talking just of what it takes for an authorized service interruption, an ASI, and how many stickers are involved. And what, what do you want to do if you want to cancel an ASI all of a sudden? Who do you have to communicate that to? We got to communicate that now to our customer that may have collaborated with perhaps their facility manager or somebody else, another stakeholder that they had an agreement with. So there is a lot of voices involved in this project. That, that's why when someone says, why is it taking so long? It's a lot of work. So I would just say to anyone that's involved in this effort, uh, make sure that you understand the full scope of the work uh, and not simply one component of, of the solution because there's so many pieces involved here. And what about Global Service Desk? Where do you jump in in the migration? So let me add on to jump on what Miguel said. So the, the discovery teams that go out there, don't play poker with them because as they're pulling back the layers of that onion and finding the ugly that every network has, they have gotten masterful at keeping that straight face and not, you know, showing like, oh my God, what is that? <laughs> you know, so they, they, the team is wonderful and this, I'm impressed sometimes with how they can just keep that professional, you know, even when they find some stuff that just will blow your mind. So back to Laura's question. Uh, what, where does the service test? So we're, we're part of the discovery team. So part of, uh, as Miguel and, and Laura's teams are going in there talking about the network, talking about infrastructure, we're also going in there talking about what is their service desk. We're doing the, the discovery of how their service desk, the processes, the procedures, what data points are they presenting, what does their uh, uh, ticket infrastructure look like. So we're going in there and doing a discovery to find out what they do today to support their mission. On the other side, the tier two, the desktop support, we uh, look in and, and dis we find out what their common applications that they use, um, what kind of VIP support. You know, everybody thinks they're a VIP, but when you start paying for it, you really start getting to the true grid of who VIPs are. Um, everybody wants to be one, but, you know, not everybody can be one. So it's setting those expectations, understanding the customer's mission. So we are a part of each of these phases of the processes, the five phases, um, from the very beginning. And, and we have multiple teams, so we're agile enough so that one team that may be the tier one team that's working with the services, we may be in a separate phase of this than our tier two. Um, so we have to be agile and make sure that we can move in different parts of the phases so that we're not locked down, so that we can constantly move. And as the team moves on, it, we may have multiple customers that we have to uh, provide that same level of support to. So as our as our teams move through the processes, they may move from one customer to the other and start over, which creates a, a, a center of excellence for those teams. So we to kind of round it up. We start from the very beginning, and we have multiple teams moving through the processes, and it allows us to uh, stay agile and adapt to other customers. Thank you, Laura. Okay. Shouldn't have turned my mic off. Okay, so this is the global service desk. We are the single service entry point for all of DISA. Uh, we're slowly moving into the single entry point for all of 
the four E agencies. And what does that mean? So we, we do that through uh, transparency. We want to provide you as a customer the most data that we can provide so that you can make business decisions. Um, let me get to this. Tier zero. So a lot of people, what is tier zero? Tier zero is self-help. It's, so I'm a tier zero carpenter. I go to YouTube and I look up how to build a wall. I just did it last weekend when I was working in a shop. You know, and that's what we want to provide you as a customer. How do I do X, Y, and Z on my computer? How do I reset a password? Is there a self-help portal? Those are the kind of things that we want to provide end users. Now, that doesn't mean you have to go to the tier zero first. There are, and I'm, I'm just as bad when it comes to like my uh, electric company or, or service providers. I don't want to hear the robot saying, you know, we have a web portal. I, I, I want to talk to a person. So we still have our tier one. We still have our call tree that you can, you know, hit one, hit two, hit three. I know it, it, the more numbers you hit, it can get frustrating, but because we, we do have such a large uh, customer base. But how do we get you through that? We provide each of our customers the call tree options ahead of time. So they know they can predict, okay, I need to hit one, then I need to hit two, so, so that they can be quicker and dynamic for VIPs. Um, if, if our customers have a VIP uh, service, we provide them a VIP, like a pin, that puts them at the top of the line, puts them at the top of the, the call tree, um, and it also elevates how their ticket is handled. So those are some of the things, which, which means what is all this uh, focus around? Faster resolution uh, of the incident, getting, getting you back to doing business um, and, and supporting the mission that you, that you're, that's important to you as quick as possible. And again, transparency. We just, as my years, I've done service tests for so many years, back in the Marine Corps at Camp Pendleton and then the Oklahoma National Guard. Um, service test, transparency. You know, it, it was always you had to call somebody to find out about your ticket. But we're working through, um, with the tools that we've got, we're working through having portals that the customers can go see and they can drive down and dive down into their tickets. Yes, that gives the customer transparency in me and they can say what is going on. So it keeps me accountable, but that's what I'm here for. I'm here to be held accountable to a standard that supports the mission. And shame on me or my team if we don't. And, and we get that call and we say, hey, why did this happen? And we hold ourselves accountable. We have to. That's, that's, our, that's our mission. That's what we're here for. Uh, cost avoidance, you know, as, as you do a tier zero self-help, you know, we, we avoid um, customers calling in through, um, you know, or emails. So it, it, as you go up, the, the concept, the industry practice, it says, as you go up in a tier from a tier one to a tier two, tier tier three, your resolution time extends. They say customer satisfaction gets less likely. And as you're going up the tiers, those are the higher level supports. Those are the individuals that are making, you know, the, the expert, the uh, subject matter expert money. So we want to try to keep it at the lowest tier for multiple reasons. Um, what do we as a service desk, we started with the, uh, the Desmith, and, and if you've never read that, it's a great uh, article, 160 something pages to read if you need to get some sleep. Um, I was reading through uh, version four last night. It was wonderful. But it's a framework that the DOD has. It's the left and right boundaries with which we do multiple IT operations. So that's kind of the construct. There's a, sp a part in it for application support, IT operations, service desk. And those are the items that we've built our construct of global service desk around. And then, of course, we have HDI, ITEL, you know, the other processes and procedures that we use to make us try to be the best in practice, the best in the industry for our warfighters. Um, repeatable outcomes, that, that's kind of self-explanatory. As, as we um, expand our scope of our tier two, our tier one teams into larger agencies, we learn something that took place over with this group we have repeatable outcomes. If it happens over here, our teams learn. So we're able to do that tier zero, that tier one. Um, and that's, that's really the meat of this, is just explaining 
what does the service desk provide? Does the service desk, and not just the service desk, but what also the tier two? How do we support? What is the expectations, and and how do we move forward? And ultimately, what is our ultimate goal? It's to provide the necessary mission items for the warfighter. You know, and and nothing is more real than what was going on with Ukraine, and in some of the uh, the other meetings, the other uh, get-togethers, you hear about that. How how DISA and other partners are are dealing with that, and they don't have time to deal with hunting down problems. And we got to get that return to service, and it starts with me as the single ser- as the single entry point, and then making sure we get those parties involved to get resolution as quick as possible. Okay. Thank you. Okay, yep. So that's the end of our, our slides. Um, we have about 14 minutes left. So we wanted to take this time to uh, open up to any questions. Sure. Okay. I don't think there's a mic. Oh, there's a mic. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Hello, thank you. This, I'm Meg Hart and I work at DFAS. Um, we use the catalog. We love it. There's a lot of opportunity for saving money, and it saves us from having to contract as well. Um, but there has been some hiccups, and so my question is, have you implemented a process that we aren't aware of, or what is your plan for the future? I realize you have a lot of customers, um, but sometimes the base products aren't suitable uh, for our needs. Um, and so, you know, is there some sort of feedback mechanism that could be implemented before procurement of, say, specific laptops, right? So mm-hmm. that we make sure that we are able to order and it does meet our needs and um, meets other mission partner needs as well. Yes. And first, thank you for the testimony. We're going to put your words on a slide next time. Now, um, <laughs> Yes, there is a process. So uh, for our customers out there, if, you, if you're looking at the catalog and you're using it and it's not quite meeting your needs, the um, easiest way is to contact either me, Miguel, like reach out to one of us. We're on Teams. You can find us um, and say, okay, I got a problem. The first thing we're going to ask you is, well, what is the requirement? Mm-hmm. Because our end state is not just to add a bunch of equipment onto this catalog because that drives us our, of our costs, and we have this you know variety out there. We're really trying to get down to you can have ch- endpoint A mm-hmm. or B, mm-hmm. and unfortunately, it's part of like trying to get customers to say, okay, if this truly is not meeting your requirement, at that point we're gonna we would decide you know, we would start to look into other opportunities and say, well, all right, we d- really do need to support option C endpoint here. Prior to that, though, we're probably going to ask you a bunch of like questions about that requirement and try to find another way, that, in some other way that we already offer, see if we can meet that need instead before we have to offer something that's non-standard or added to the catalog or something sure. else that is supportable. Um, but we've done it, and I, we've at the customer request, we now have laptops on that catalog that have embedded cameras. So it's possible, and we have done it, we just, you know, we toss it at, at these two first to test and make sure it's absolutely supportable. So there is a way to do it. It just, it takes a couple months to get it out there. Sure. And we've been ordering the ones with cameras. So yeah. thank you. Um, my only feedback would be, you know, maybe instead of an after the fact process, you know, we would happily give input beforehand if possible to help make your process more efficient too. Yep. The last thing we want is to have... 10 different options that makes it harder for us to order as well but um, we do appreciate the process and the work on it it has saved us money and has made it easier to order things like cameras and laptops so good thank you hello there Uh, Tom Kopko I work at CyberArk and uh, I I sort of had questions about the scope of the 4 ENO contract and uh, how far into the mission partner agencies that you serve? For example, mission partner applications. Mm-hmm. DLA has got lots of different applications that they run their business and do their logistics on. Is your program affecting that, protecting it? Um, 
managing the updates to the application or the cybersecurity of those applications, and then sort of in the same way, uh, does the program or how much defensive cyber ops does your program operate? I can, I can start. You want that one? Yeah. Okay. Okay, so from an application support, we the parts that we reach into the four agencies are commodity. So to, to get a quick definition of commodity versus mission. Commodity is your desktops, your laptops, printers. Uh, mission is the components, like uh, servers that are hosting for, uh, let's say DLA, the logistical uh, tracking pieces. So to separate those two, we don't, for the 4E, we're focusing on the commodity side, which is your desktop printers. Um, so we, we have a standard for the commodity side for the workstations. We have a standard image that is uh, DOD CIO approved, Army Cyber uh, confirmed, and, and of course follows the STIG guidelines. So from that perspective, from an application device, uh, desktop device support, um, we, we, that's the layers with which we provide cyber. Now from a network perspective, I think Miguel is, my, is the expert on that and I'll let him. Yeah, so in, in certain cases, so it depends on what the mission is, right? So if the mission has already followed IT reform, it's moved to a cloud service, then we're gonna try to make sure that we're providing the transport to get to that cloud environment. On the endpoint, they may have a, a console application or a mission specific application that is required. In that case, we need to deploy that piece of software to the machine and we make sure that the firewalls rules are set to be able to access that. In other cases, some mission systems may be still on premise. We're gonna provide their transport. But when we do that, we gotta make sure there's network segmentation involved. They need to be able to control their systems. We need to make sure that there is still a zero trust model in place so that there is no ability for there to be an attack, whether it be from uh, whatever perspective it comes from, right? Whoever, whether it be inside or outside. So, in terms of the application that the mission partner has, we have to know that beforehand with them to understand what they need from us. There, for example, there may be a request where uh, next day they need to have a, a special update to the endpoint environment. We may need to escalate that request such that we can actually meet that timeline. We need to, it would be best if we knew that in advance. If not, we need to collaborate with them directly about that. And therefore, we need to make sure that our change management processes and all of our request policies are able to meet that SLA. So, so there's a lot of work that we do with them. And sorry, as a follow-up question, um, are part of the Enclave services, does that include um, any portions of Zero Trust, whether it be MFA services and, and those sorts of things? Yeah, so our service still rides and built on the other services that DISA has. So for example, today we do leverage uh, JRSS, Joint Regional Security Stack. We do plan to use Thunderdome. They're in a current pilot phase right now, we're talking to them. So in that sense, we're going to leverage what the agency comes with, and we're gonna use those practices that they have. In addition, there, if you were there at the, uh, the panel yesterday, they talked a lot about the SASE and how the client itself will have a new client uh, software. We're gonna be part of that. Right? So we're going to be transforming and changing the way the VPN experience works. So we need to understand what that is. One of the things that we talk about, and we talk about the maturity level of other services, is, okay, you have created a pilot program. You have certainly created a vision of what you want. Now you're going to hand it off to us to deploy it. You want to make sure that Core's group, now if someone has a, a need for resolution, we can take care of that. We also need to anticipate what the next changes are. So we certainly do uh, use them. We're also leveraging today CSSP, cybersecurity, uh, uh, provider, so we leverage a lot of services. We don't only provide our own services, TANS keyboard, but we work a lot within DISA to make sure that we are optimizing and refining to the best service we have. Thank you. Hi there. I was hoping you could go back to the IT primary reform goals, that very early slide, and kind of talk about how you um, prioritize your activities, uh, the earlier one. There was like four parts going into a. Oh, go keep like the one very, I very early. early. Yeah. yeah. Oh. Yes, that. One. Could you talk about that kind of how you prioritize sort of activities to achieve these various goals? If you're asking, do we have which one of these is the highest priority? They they all are. It's not like we can you know prioritize cybersecurity over money, uh, you know, things like that. Um, we, it's kind of an equal balance 
of all of the goals trying to work together and in equal measure. So one of the things we frequently do, almost on a daily basis, we, we constantly ask ourselves, can I stop doing this in, in order to do that? And does that meet the goals of where we're supposed to go? And is this worth putting all of my manpower and resources into? Is this going anywhere? Um, and we frequently annoy our, our partners in internal to DISA because we ask them the same questions. We're like, do you have a plan for this? You know, is this, how, how do I, when it comes to us, we, we have to take that internally and we have to prioritize it and we have to say, can we keep supporting this? So what um, does this meet the goals of where we need to go in order to meet these IT reform goals? Um, is this going to increase security? But if it does, how much more money? And it's, it's, it's very difficult to say what our number one priority is because it's almost like that, that triangle of cost schedule performance. They all have to work together and they all have to, there has to be compromise them you know you can't just go all in on on performance and ignore the others so and, go ahead yeah I, I, I agree with Laura there's a lot of trade-offs that we have to analyze and, and look at one of the things that I that I, I look at from a cybersecurity perspective is is it introducing a vulnerability is there a lateral movement that's possible um, is it asking of me to provide privilege access to order this effort. Um, what, again, what does that CONOPS look like for this tool set? Again, there's also the balance of, for, that, uh, for, the, for the fourth estate uh, agency, what is their mission? What do they require? So, without understanding a little bit more about each specific scenario, it's a little bit tough to, to answer that. But I would agree, Laura, that in every aspect of it, we have to look at the trade-offs. Um, the, the initial ask is, how do you get started? But the sustainment. Uh, what does this require of us, you know, six months from now, a year from now, to be able to, to support this? Does the current application that you're asking about, is it going to be able to be able to be updates? Or perhaps it's a legacy software that uh, is not appropriate for that environment, and we have to create a new solution. New solutions, they're going to create variety. Those varieties are not required. Different skill sets. Uh, if there are legacy how many experts are there out in the marketplace to go out and hire against them? Uh, what are we looking at here for total cost? Again, back to total cost. So again, there, there's a lot of uh, items that have to be analyzed first before we can just uh, reach and say there's one. But all to be customer satisfaction is, is a high priority, of course. Uh, we work a lot with each of the uh, field activities and, uh, to understand what are their pain points, what is important to them, um, so that it's them from accomplishing their mission. Okay, we have two minutes left. If there's any other questions, then okay. I'll just leave with this. Uh, one thing to make sure we also emphasize here is a little bit more about the, the scope. So, to understand it, we're also the last mile. Um, there's a lot of things that are asked about about speed and agility, and how can we get uh, senior to turn on the service. But when we're talking about that, we have to understand again, what is the starting point that we're beginning for an individual location of uh, ADAFA? Are you asking of them to uh, now upgrade their entire suite of hardware? Are you asking them to now upgrade the circuits? Do, are we asking them to change their business processes? Um, are we asking for a culture change of some sort? You know, we really want to make sure that when we're, we're going through this, we understand the full scope of, of the solution so that, again, the, the agency and the customer can understand it as well so that they can fully adopt the service. Um, if, you, if you, however, if you bypass one of those pieces, and let's say you bypass the, the site survey, and you create, you create this great cloud-based solution, well, how good is it if it's interrupted uh, so that you can't connect to it? Um, if you can't access something, if you can't see a video or can't hear your, your boss, your colleague talking to you, uh, you're going to be obviously frustrated. So we need to make sure that their levels of service uh, are built on a strong infrastructure, on a strong foundation, and then surround those technologies with proper governance. So again, we have to understand the, the change management, we have to understand how all these uh, tools are interoperating. Uh, in addition, we do want to get to full automation 
to get to automation, you may have under, uh, heard a little more about interoperability. Well, we need to understand what those APIs look like. Uh, one of the things that we're tackling now is how do we uh, hasten fast and fasten onboarding for a customer? How can we remove manual efforts so that when you come on board on day one, you have a fully employed uh, that is, has a computer, is able to do their work. And so in order to, to do that, we actually have to understand more about the environment. Uh, it is, not all solutions are uh, about having more manpower. Not also, not all solutions are simply about, let's go get some uh, great equipment. It, it, it's all of it put together. All right. All right. All right. So uh, I think with that, we actually have ran over time. <laughs> So first off, I just want to thank everybody for attending. Uh, we started off a little bit late, of course, but uh, you stuck in with us, uh, so thank you so much. Um, and we're going to be here a little available if you have more questions for us. So thank you. Thank you, Gal.